Well, if you have your Bible today, I hope that you do. Would you open your Bible with me to Acts chapter 11? Uh, We're going to look this morning at verses 19 through 26 as we continue to make our way through the New Testament. I want to talk to you today about the hand of the Lord. You know, what child has not tenderly caressed and closely examined the hand of a loving father? I remember when I was a child, and that was a long time ago, but I remember my father's big old hand, his blood vessels, and I always thought his hand was just so strong, and uh, it, was so, it's, it was such a loving hand to me. It was a hand of blessing. It was a hand of provision. It was a hand of security. Well, likewise... There is something special about the hand of our Heavenly Father. If you've read the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, there are many times the Bible uses the phrase, the hand of the Lord, or the right hand of God, or God's hand. Uh, You'll see that many, many times throughout the Scripture where the Bible refers specifically to the hand of God of the Lord. At times, that hand can be a heavy hand of conviction. Sometimes God's hand is heavy on us. In Psalm 32, verse 3 and 4, when David had sinned and tried to cover up his sin, the Bible says, David said, when I kept silent about my sin, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, here it is, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. So there are times as believers we feel a heavy hand of conviction when we're living in sin. And that's the loving hand of God convicting our sin. But there are other times when God's hand is a hand of a gracious hand of provision. In Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10, the Bible says, "Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you." Here it is. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And so we see all through the scripture the hand of the Lord. In our text today, in Acts chapter 11, the hand of the Lord was with the believers at a city called Antioch, and a powerful church was born in that city. And so we're going to look at the story today about the birth of the church at Antioch. And the main idea I want to share with you today is that it is a great blessing for the hand of the Lord to be on your life. You want the hand of the Lord to be on your life. As a believer, oh, I pray for God's hand to be on my life, even if it is a hand of conviction. I mean, there are times I need that. And and, and especially in ministry, I want the Lord's hand to be on my life. So we're going to see an example of the hand of the Lord today in the Scripture. Would you stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word? And let's read Acts chapter 11, beginning with verse 19. It says, Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, he was the first martyr that we read about in chapter 7, And there was persecution, and it caused the believers to scatter. And they traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenist, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And here's the phrase. Look at it. Verse 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And get this, in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mighty hand. God, we know it's a personal hand. And we long for your hand to be on our church. We long for your hand to be upon our lives. God, give us ears to hear what your spirit would say today to your church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
<clears throat> so indeed, it is a great blessing for the hand of the Lord to be on your life. You want the hand of the Lord to be on your life. And when God's hand is on your life, there are four things that happen that I want you to see right out of our text this morning. Leave your Bible open to our text. And notice this, that when, God, when God's hand is on your life, genuine hurdles will be removed. Genuine hurdles, genuine obstacles, genuine barriers in your life will be removed. When, when the early church was birthed at Jerusalem, it was mainly Jews. It was, it was predominantly a Jewish congregation. 3,000 were baptized. You remember Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. The very first church we read about in the Bible was the church at Jerusalem. But after persecution started and God allowed persecution to come on the early believers, the first person martyred was Stephen, and we read about that in chapter 7, and that persecution was somewhat of a blessing because it caused all of the Christians in Jerusalem to be scattered, and they began to be scattered all over the Roman Empire. And, and we'll remember how as they were scattered, where, what did they do? Everywhere they went, they were sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. They were sharing the gospel. So persecution caused people like me and you to go to different places to spread the good news, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. In chapter 8, Philip, who was one of the early deacons, took the message to the Samaritans. So he, he shared Christ with the Samaritans, and they were saved. A little bit later in that chapter, Philip was led by the Spirit to go to the desert, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch there, and there was a divine encounter, and Philip shared the gospel with the Ethiopian eunuch, and the Ethiopian eunuch was saved, and now the gospel traveled to Africa through the Ethiopian eunuch. And then in chapter 10, Peter was led to go to a man named Cornelius, who was a Gentile, even though Peter said, Lord, I will never go into something that's unclean, Jesus said, hey, I've made it clean. I want you to go to the Gentiles. And Peter shared the gospel with uh, the Gentiles that were in Cornelius' house, and the gospel came to the Gentiles. Do you see what's happening here? The barriers of prejudice, the barriers of social uh, barriers that kept people separate are being broken down by the gospel, by the love of Jesus Christ. And Jews are being saved. Samaritans are being saved. Gentiles are being saved. And here we read about the Hellenist. Hellenist were Greek-speaking Jews. They were Jews that were attracted to Greek culture, and they kind of forsook their Jewish rituals and began to adopt the Greek lifestyle. And, and they began to uh, speak Greek and live like Greeks, and therefore they were hated because they, they were not Orthodox Jews. They walked away from traditional Judaism. And, and, and here, some of the believers that were scattered came to the city of Antioch, and they shared the gospel there. And many were saved. The city of Antioch was a significant city. It was the third largest city in the Roman Empire, only behind Rome and Alexandria. It was the capital of Syria, 300 miles north of Jerusalem, and had a population of a half million people. Wow. It was a very um, wealthy city. The Roman author Cicero described it as a place of learned men and liberal studies. It was also a place full of pagan worship and sexual immorality. It was the only city in the world at the time that literally had streetlights. <laughs> it had streetlights on its marble road. Antioch was a wicked city, perhaps only second to Corinth, and it was full of Greek culture and immoral practices. Isn't it amazing that it was in this city that the hand of the Lord led Philip and these Christians that were scattered, and the hand of the Lord was on them, and a great many people in this culture, in this city, were led to Christ. Oh, hallelujah. When the hand of the Lord is on you, Barriers, difficulties will be overcome. 
And that's been true all through the Bible. In, in Joshua chapter 4, the Bible says in verse 23 through 24, For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over it, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea. So that all the peoples of the earth may know that, here's that phrase, so that all the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is what? Mighty. And that you may fear the Lord your God. Beloved, for Moses, who was just a common man, the hand of the Lord removed a major barrier. The Red Sea was parted by the hand of the Lord. For Joshua who is another young leader for Christ. The hand of the Lord was with him. The Jordan River was parted just like the Red Sea. And right here in Antioch, this pagan city that, that had Hellenists that were despised and hated by the Jews, the hand of the Lord was on them and a great number of people were led to the Lord. I love the words of Warren Wearsby. He said, when the persecuted believers arrived in Antioch, listen, the word of God was on their lips And the hand of God was on their lives, and a great number of sinners repented and believed. Maybe today you are facing obstacles, challenges, barriers in your life. You want the hand of the Lord to be on you. The hand of the Lord is a hand that can remove obstacles and remove barriers. Maybe you have a loved one that's lost and has been lost for a long time. And, and, and you have tried to share your faith and you've not been able to break through. There, there is like a wall of, that cannot be penetrated. And you have, you have prayed and you have asked God for the salvation of this person who refuses to believe. Well, let's pray today for the hand of the Lord to be on your life. And that that great barrier would be removed. Genuine barriers will be removed by the hand of the Lord. Secondly, I want you to notice this, great works will be accomplished. When when great barriers are removed, great works can be accomplished. Look at verse 21. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. There There was a great work that was done in the city of Antioch. Great People were saved. A great church was born. Second to the church at Jerusalem, the church at Antioch may be the the most important church that was birthed in uh, the, the New Testament times. Stephen Cole says it is significant that when God picked a city that would become the center for missionary endeavor, he picked a cosmopolitan, morally corrupt city like Antioch. In this secular pagan environment, common Christians begin telling the simple gospel message that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And whoever believes in him receives eternal life and forgiveness as a gift, a free gift of God. The same gospel that is the power of God for salvation to the Jews proved to be the power of God's salvation to the pagan Gentiles as well. When you think about God doing a great work. What do you think about? What is your vision? When you think about God doing a great work in your life, do you believe that God could? Do you believe that God desires to? I believe he does. I believe that God desires to do a great work in your life. And you may think, well, I'm nobody. (laughs) So were they. (laughs) I mean, they, they were nobody. I mean, we don't even know who these people were that took the gospel to Antioch. We know Philip took it to the Samaritans, but it only says here in the Bible that there were some men from Cyprus and Cyrene that took it to the Hellenist. They were nobody. We, don't even, we still don't even know their name. And yet it was through these men, these simple common men, that, that many people were saved and a great church was born that's still impacting the world today. And, and, and so maybe you think, well, I'm nobody. I mean, God can never use me to do a great work. And I would say to you, oh, yes, not only can he, he wants to. He desires to do a great work in you and through you. But when we think about God doing a great work in our life, 
the question that we have to ask is, why do we want God to do a great work in our life? Do we want God to do a great work in our life for selfish reasons? Do we want God to do a great work in our life so we can say, oh, wow, look what God did through me? Or do we want God to do a great work for him so that the glory and the honor and the testimony goes to him? Beloved, we as a body of Christ, we as believers, we want God to do a great work in us and through us for the glory of God, our Heavenly Father. Elijah was a man, the Bible says, was common to us. That's what it says in James. Elijah the prophet was a man just like us, common man. And yet he prayed that it would not rain. And you know what happened? It didn't rain for three and a half years. Because he was praying to get the attention of wicked King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. He, he, was, he knew how pagan and ungodly they were. And so he prayed that it wouldn't rain to get their attention and to get them to realize that they needed God in their life. Boy, we need that in America today, right? I mean, not, I, I don't want it not to rain for three and a half years. But something needs to get our attention. Our greatest need in America is to turn back to God. That's our greatest need. And something has got to wake us up and get our attention. So Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years. It didn't rain for three and a half years. And then the Bible says that after the Mount Carmel experience, where he called the fire down from heaven, that he prayed that it would rain. Now I want you to see what the Bible says in 1 Kings 18, verse 45 through 46. In a little while, after he prayed that it would rain, after three and a half years of drought... In a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And here it is. Here's that phrase. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezebel. The hand of the Lord was on him. You see, when the hand of the Lord is on your life, great works will be accomplished. Great barriers will be removed. The third thing I want you to see is that God's people will be encouraged. When God's hand is on your life, God's people will be encouraged. Now come in here with me and follow me in this. In verse 22, it says that the church at Jerusalem heard about this. They heard about the church at Antioch. And so they sent one of their best encouragers whose name was Barnabas. Barnabas was, his name meant son of encouragement. He was an encourager. So they sent Barnabas a 300-mile journey from Jerusalem to Antioch to be there to encourage them. And when he came, it says, verse 23, and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he encouraged them to remain faithful to the Lord and steadfast of purpose. For Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, And the result of his encouragement, a great many more people were added to the Lord. So God's doing a great work in Antioch. Now here's what Barnabas did. Barnabas left Antioch to go to Tarsus to look for a man named Saul. And he found him. And that word implies he had to really search hard to find him. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people uh, there in the city of Antioch. Now, what is that all about? You see, you read, if, you, if you're reading the Bible with us this week, we read this week about the conversion of Saul. He was a persecutor of the church. He participated in the martyrdom of Stephen. And yet, as Saul was on the road to Damascus to persecute more Christians because he didn't believe in Jesus, he met the resurrected Jesus on the road to Damascus, right? And there was a bright light that blinded him, and he couldn't see, and he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And they took him as he was blinded into the city of Damascus, and God used a man named Ananias to come to him and share the gospel with Paul, with Saul, and he was saved. And God changed his name from Saul to Paul. Right after he was saved, he went and began to share the gospel at Damascus. He began to preach the gospel. And as he was preaching the gospel, they wanted to kill him. 
Those that were the persecutors of believers now were persecuting Saul. And, and so they had to let him out of Damascus by putting him in a basket and let him down over a wall. He went from Damascus to Jerusalem. And when he got to Jerusalem, the disciples were afraid of him. The disciples, Peter, James, and John, and those guys said, well, we don't trust him. He's the one that was persecuting the church. But guess who? Barnabas befriended him. And Barnabas heard his testimony. And Barnabas became his advocate and brought him to the rest of the disciples and said, hey, this guy's been saved. He's no longer the persecutor of the church. He's one of us. And so Paul came in and began to preach the word of God at Jerusalem. But as soon as he began to preach the word of God at Jerusalem, again, there was a group that wanted to kill him. You know who the group is that wanted to kill him? The Hellenist. The Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jews, the very ones that were the, the people led to Christ at Antioch. Well, the Bible says that when they tried to kill him at Jerusalem, he went back to Tarsus, his hometown. So he had kind of dropped out of ministry, like a lot of pastors. His first church didn't go very well in Damascus. His second ministry didn't go very well. The Hellenists wanted to kill him. So he went back and started making tents in Tarsus. In the Bible, theologians call it the silent years of Saul. We really don't know a lot about those years. But for four to seven years, he was in Tarsus. It was Barnabas who went to Antioch and saw the Hellenist come to know Jesus that never forgot the potential of this incredible man named Saul. So he left Hellenist. He left Antioch went all the way to Tarsus, had to search for him and found him and said, you need to get back in ministry and I want you to come with me. You got to see this. And so he brought, he, bought, he brought Paul back to Antioch and the Bible says for a whole year, they, Paul and Barnabas, met with the church and taught a great many people the word of God. You see, what Barnabas did for Saul it's what we in the church need to do for a lot of people today. A lot of people today, for some reason or another, get hurt. Maybe they get hurt by the church. Maybe they get their eyes off the Lord and they go away. And, and, and they forgot the hand of God. And, and there are times that we need to go find them and encourage them and bring them back. Barnabas did that. And we know the rest of the story. What if Barnabas had not gone to Tarsus to find Saul? Well, there's a lot of chapters in the book of Acts that may have never been written, right? Because the rest of the book of Acts is about how God's hand was on Paul and the great things that he did. So you see, when the hand of the Lord is on you, God's people will be encouraged. Paul was encouraged by the salvation of the Hellenists, who were the very ones that wanted to kill him in Jerusalem. And it brought him back into ministry. Nehemiah, who also was just a common person, a slave in Babylon, in, in, uh, for Syria and the Babylonians, became the cupbearer of the king of Syria. And, or, uh, of, yeah, of Syria, and, 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 and he began to have a burden for Jerusalem that had been destroyed, the walls were torn down, and he wanted to go back and help rebuild the walls. But how does a slave who's a cupbearer's king, the cupbearer for the king get back to rebuild the walls? Well, he prayed. <laughs> and God used King Cyrus uh, to let him go back to Jerusalem. But not only did King Cyrus let him go back, he funded the project. He gave the money to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 8 and 18, listen. It says, the king granted me what I asked for. And the good hand of my God was on me. Verse 18, when he got the people around him, he said, I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also the works that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. What did Nehemiah tell them about? The good hand of the Lord. Beloved, we want the good hand of the Lord to be upon our lives. The last thing I want you to see is that glorious testimonies will be told. 
When God's hand is upon us, glorious testimonies will be told. In verse 26, the last part of that verse, it says, In Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. (laughs) How about that? The word Christians is only used three times in the New Testament. Most of the time, the believers are called disciples. But here they were called Christians. You know what the word Christian means? It means little Christ. They, they look like Christ. You see, here at Antioch, the hand of the Lord was on them. God was doing such a great work that those Hellenists who were immoral people began to look a lot like Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? You see, that's what we want. We want people to come to North Park. We want the hand of the Lord to be on our church. When people come here, no matter who they are, we want them to begin to look a lot like Jesus. We want to have a ministry to our community that looks a lot like Jesus. But that's not the end of the story. If you, if you go over to chapter 13 real quick, and you look at chapter 13, after Barnabas and Saul had been preaching for a year at the church at Antioch, it says in verse 2, while they were worshiping at the church at Antioch, they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work that we have called them to do. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. The church at Antioch was not only the first place where the disciples were called Christians, but it was the first missionary sending church. They were the very first church that laid hands on two missionaries named Paul and Barnabas and sent them out. And we're going to read the rest of that throughout the book of Acts. Paul went on four or five missionary journeys and, and the great revival that took place in the Roman Empire was largely due to the missionary work of, of, of Paul. And it was the church at Antioch that birthed that. And, and, and get this, you want to see what discipleship looks like? Paul and Barnabas were the teachers of the church at Antioch. And you know what they're doing? They're sending their teachers away on missionary work. So what does that mean? They had already raised up other teachers to teach at the church at Antioch while they were out doing the missionary work of the Lord. Guys, these are the things that we see happen when the hand of the Lord is upon you and upon a church. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 and 6, that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So you may well ask, Pastor, well, you've told us all the things that the hand of the Lord does. How do we get the hand of the Lord on our life? Well, here's the principle right here. God resists the proud. If you, if you are full of pride and you want to do things your way, and you say, well, Lord, I can handle it, I'll do it my way, then God will say, okay, all right. And his hand won't be on your life. If, if we, we are living our lives for our glory, for our purpose, and we want to do it our way, not God's way, you want to know how the hand of the Lord will not be on your life, or maybe the heavy hand of conviction, then pride. Pride goeth before a fall. But notice it says that, that God gives grace to the humble. And then it goes on in the next verse and says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. The way that the hand of the Lord is on your life is you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. You repent of your sin. You come before him as an empty vessel. And you say, God, not my will, but thy will be done in my life think about the hand of jesus it was the hand of jesus remember who reached out and touched a leper and he was healed do you need healing today do you need supernatural divine healing it comes from the hand of the lord do you remember when that little boy put that lunch of fish and loaves in the hands of Jesus, just a little tiny lunch, and there were 5,000 hungry people. And Jesus took that in his hands and blessed it. And he took that lunch and distributed it to over 5,000 people, and there were 12 baskets left over. That's what happens when you put your needs in the hands of the Lord. Do you remember Peter? 
when he was trying to do the work of the Lord, walk on water, but he began to sink because he took his eyes off Jesus. You know, you know what it was? It was the hand of the Lord that reached down in that water when, Jesus, when Peter said, save me. It was the hand of the Lord that brought him back up. If you're here today, you feel like you've took your eyes off the Lord, you're sinking. It's the hand of Jesus right now that's willing to reach down and lift you back up. Can I tell you one other thing about that hand? We'll close. It's the hand of Jesus that today is a nail-scarred hand. It's a nail-scarred hand. If you were to see Jesus today, just like Thomas saw him, and Thomas said, well, I won't believe that he's risen until I reach out my hand and put it in the, in the nails, print in his hand. And, and Jesus appeared to Thomas and said, Thomas, here I am. Reach out your hand and see. Today, that hand of Jesus is a nail-scarred hand. There are nails in both of his hands. And can I tell you why those nails are there? Because of his incredible, unbelievable love for you. He was pierced for your transgressions. He, his hands are nail scarred so that he can save you. So that you who cannot save yourself and you can't go to heaven with all this sin in your life. His hands were pierced so that you could be forgiven. And if you will put your faith in Jesus Christ, that nail scarred hand, that hand will be the hand of salvation for you. And oh, I pray today that you would put your faith in his nail-scarred hand. Is God's heavy hand of conviction on your life today? Maybe you've sinned, maybe you've turned away from God, maybe you've never been saved. And God's heavy hand of conviction is drawing you to God. Oh, I pray that you would respond to that today. Is God's gracious hand of provision on your life today? Is it? It can be. If you would humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Would you bow with me as we pray? If you're here today, God's heavy hand of conviction is on your life. You've never been saved. You've never been baptized. You don't know for sure if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven. Can I tell you there's a nail-scarred hand that's willing to reach down and save you right now? It's the hand of Jesus Christ who died for your sins. And my prayer is today that today would be the day that you humble yourself and that you put your faith in him. If that is what you desire to do, would you just pray this prayer with me in your heart? Dear Jesus... I need you. I thank you for that nail-scarred hand that took that nail and was pierced for my transgressions. Today, I believe I no longer want to live under this heavy hand of conviction. But today, I want to humble myself. I want to turn away from my sin. And I want to put my trust in you. I believe that you died, that you were buried. And Lord Jesus, you arose again. And right now, I trust you for my salvation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.